So I came on here in June and told you all that I wouldn't be reading any new books this month. Let the record show that was a lie. Let's get into it. <laughs> Hola mi gente, Ms. Malcolm Hughes here. Welcome, welcome back. Today we are going to be discussing all of the books that I read in June. I'll be telling you all how I felt about them and whether or not you should read them. So there were a number of books that were read. I did tell you all that I wasn't reading any new books because I wanted to kind of come on and update you all and read the books that I said that I was going to read throughout the year that hadn't been read yet. That kind of happened it it kind of happened <laughs> some of them were read but as i posted over on my instagram and if you're not following me there definitely do that as the weather gets warmer all i want to do is read romance listen to trap music and shake my hips so <laughs> the reading of the romance kind of took precedent over some of the other books that i was reading because that's the mood that i'm in and above anything else y'all know i'm a mood reader first so You'll see a mix today, but let's just go ahead and get into the ones that I read. One of the stories you've heard me talk about often here on the channel, or one of the books, is Shouting in the Fire by Dante Stewart, an American Epistle. And this story took me on a ray of emotions. It is his memoir-esque. It's an epistle, which is supposed to be like a letter, but I'm not really sure who the letter is to, so I think of it more as a memoir of key moments of his life. We go on the journey uh, with Dante of unpacking moments of, in his life and him grappling with being black, being from the South, and also being Christian. And what does that mean? And how those things have intersected within his life and how they've caused conflict, confusion, a loss of identity, and really trying to figure out where he feels safe and where he can be safe within his religious understanding and how he navigated through a lot of white Christian spaces and there was no room for his blackness and how he just grappled with all of that. There were parts of this book that I found to be brilliant and beautiful and really resonated, right? It was also frustrating sometimes, it's just heartbreaking or heart rendering to hear of someone who strayed so far of his black, so far away from his blackness and identity therein in the search of something else. But also, listen, I think a lot of people who live in the US kind of suffer from like Stockholm Syndrome and the fact of years and decades and just of abuse, right? But that being home and that being what the culture we're indoctrinated into. So that was a lot of that here. I did like his use of imagery. I thought the style of writing was good. You could kind of tell he was really early in his career. Um, but I thought he did a good job of really grappling with these complex and like difficult and mixed emotions and really trying to make sense of it. So I did walk away feeling like that was something I really appreciated that he tried to do here. Whether or not he was successful in all he aimed to do, I didn't feel that, but I thought that it was admirable. I'm looking at my notes here and I did talk about just him, his experience at the white mega church and how much that impacted him. I found that to be spot on and truthful. Um, and he talks about how the rewards of whiteness were too great and when he was going through that period and just like denying who he was and who he had been raised to be. I did say he's saying the quiet parts out loud and that it can be shattering. He's grappling with me in black and America and in America. And that's tough and this book was triggering to read, but I'm glad that he wrote it and I'm glad that he's grappling and that the writing is also really good. I think some cons for me were that it took a while to get adjusted to his writing style. It took a couple of pages, but it was easily done and easy to read after that. And I said that you can't judge anyone's journey and their honesty, but it makes me really sad that he felt he had to choose between football and acceptance and his blackness and choosing silence for security and that feeling safe. I also didn't always agree with like the quotes that he, not I didn't disagree with the quotes, but I didn't agree with his analysis of the quotes, especially around Baldwin sometimes and Baldwin's relationship with Jesus. And he referenced the fire next time, which I actually felt like was a misinterpretation. And I wanted to argue with that, but 
it can be interpreted multiple ways. But for me, I felt like Baldwin was really speaking to the sadness, the sadness and the realization that he will never be able to offer black people that blind faith that they have in Jesus um, and not encouraging a blind faith in Jesus um, or in religion in and of itself. But overall, I felt like the book was raw and vulnerable. I didn't feel like he succeeded completely in what he set out to do. I said that an endeavor such as this, I think, is the attempt that matters most. I would have structured it differently. I think it could have been shorter. I would have definitely probably reduced this book by 50 to 100 pages. Um, I said it felt out of sync in some places, and some parts were regurgitations of earlier ideas and could have been removed. It also wasn't always clear who the intended, intended audience is. Is it for everyone? Is it for white people? Is it for black people? Is it for his children? And I said it's an epistle, but to whom? It's more of a memoir, actually, at least that's how it reads. So overall, I'm glad that I read it. I really wanted to see more of how everything came together for him and how he's still grappling with it today. Because like, how does your faith look today? How have you been able to reconcile blackness? And I know he's gone back and done the reading and he's in a much better place. I know him and his wife have now transitioned back to like their family and black spaces and navigating therein. But I really wanted to know more of what does all this mean when it's all said and done? And I don't know if I got that. And I shouldn't compare this to, but I am. Um, ta Coates, Between the World and Me, because that's also an epistle, but that was very clearly written to his, uh, to his son and written after Baldwin. And it's actually the book that's referenced here, which is The Fire Next Time. And I think those two have very clear intended audiences, and I didn't get that here. And I think those two also have very clear intended messages, and I didn't get that here. So overall, I gave this a, I gave this a read when you have time, didn't hate it, but didn't love it. So check it out if you want. Another book you all have heard me reference already is Cricket Plow by Itamura Jr. And this book was another book that I felt like wasn't really about what it was said to be about. This story follows two sisters in Brazil. It opens up with a very traumatic event happening to both of them. They're drawn to something that can harm them and it ends up harming them. But we navigate the rest of the story by going on this journey with them into adulthood, how they come to rely on each other and what rips that apart, it ruptures it. And we also learn about the community that they're in. And so, we get to learn more about like black folk in Brazil and coming out of enslavement, technically sharecropping and what does that mean and how does that shape everyone? We get to see what happens when you resist that and how folks are harmed, the danger they're in. We get to learn about the spirituality and the spiritual practices. We get to see what also occurs when over time, new religions are brought in and how that shapes and shifts everything and so we really get to see this family and all that they're going through and everyone that's connected with them and so in that case i enjoyed it i thought it was cool i didn't love it as much as i thought that i was going to the writing was good but i don't know if i can credit that to like the writer or the translator but it was good i didn't love it not my favorite style of writing but it was good yeah, I don't really have a lot of thoughts about this one. Overall, I thought it was cool. It is one of the books from the Booker shortlist that I said that I was going to read. And listen, y'all will see as I continue talking about <laughs> some of those books today. But this one is better than the one that won. And we're going to talk about it. Is it a favorite? No, I ended up giving this one a read when you have time. I had a lot of read when you have times this month. It was not the best reading month, but it was cool. So another book that I want to talk about on the book of short list is Kairos by Jenny Erpenbeck. That is the only book this month and this year that I have considered a DNF. I did not like that book. I didn't like the style of writing. I didn't like the storyline. And the funny thing is when the long list came out and it was on there and I was reading the descriptions, that was the book I was least excited about. And so when it was on the short list, I was still least excited about it. And then that's the one that went on to win. I couldn't make it through the book. It was a story of this illicit affair between this young woman and this older professor. I know that it had more complexity around being in Germany and I think at the time of the war. However, it's just that was just so easy to me, so simple. The idea 
of just this affair. <laughs> and I ended up writing, um, I just wasn't here for the tour de fair. Maybe the book is exceptional, but the summary intro in chapter one did not do it for me enough to find that out for myself. I also wasn't a fan of the style of writing. There were glimpses of something potentially great, but at the same time, it felt too esoteric and nebulous. Um, congrats on winning the International Booker Prize though. That's what I said. So for me, it was just, style of writing it was one of those styles that just like flowed not like quotations and punctuations that breaks it up i'm not a fan of that it was also written that like he said she said he did she did like this ping pong hated it the story didn't have enough gusto it didn't have enough to like really bring me bring me in i felt like the story is it could be argued as timeless but i just felt like it didn't grasps my attention in any way whatsoever. Time is a limited resource and I did not want to spend it reading that book, so I didn't. Um, so yeah, that was a DNF for me. If you've read it and you feel differently, let me know. <laughs> all right, so those were the books that I told you all that I was going to read. The rest of the books for this month, I did not tell you all that I was going to read. However, they have still been read. All right. So this is the book that got, and it got me off track and kept me off track because I realized that's the mood I was in. It was Saint 2 by Miss Candace, which is the third book in the Soul Ties series. And in this one, we continue the story of Saint Baptiste. Saint and Naoki, we're still going back and forth between those two characters. They're both on their own journeys of like trying to heal. But in this book specifically, they're trying to find love and meaning. And what does that mean for them moving forward? This book was sad as heck just sad like Naoki had so much pain um I walked away from this book not sure how I felt about it um I, I did cry a few times throughout reading it because Naoki was just in so much pain and it was so sad and she was just like degrading herself so clearly and oh but we go on this journey of healing with her I did feel as if the author did a good job of showing Naoki's pain and her trying to figure out and heal it. But considering the Saint's book, I didn't feel like we got enough of that from Saint, right? Saint was toxic in book two. He's still a little toxic in book. In this book, he was toxic in book one. He's still a little toxic in this book. However, he is the more healed version. Suddenly, he's just like super knowledgeable that like she's the one and they're twin flames and he wants them to be together but it's not the right time maybe he's too early maybe he's too late but like he just hopes that it works out inevitably at some point and i love that in a sense like if that's who he really was that would have been great however i couldn't figure out where saint got that level of like knowledge understanding healing and peace and that was bothering me throughout the entire book like he's suddenly the deepest dude and so I felt like we needed to see that evolution and growth for him I also thought this book was going to be longer than it was but it wasn't and it could have been because Saint needed those um pages and I wrote in my notes I said I like the things of healing and accountability and unpacking deep familial wounds but the book could have and probably should have been longer and so I also said reading how clearly Naoki hated herself was also a challenge I like the ending. I like how it came together, but it wasn't a favorite. And I loved book one down. So for this one to be mid for me, it was a little disappointing, honestly. I didn't feel like it was a good wrap to the series, but I don't think the series is over because I think one of the other brothers, well, I think the other brother is gonna end up getting his own books. At least that was what was hinted here. I ended up giving this book a read when you have time. So like I said, the beginning of the month was not great for reading, but I continued and I pushed through and then we got some goodies. After that book, I ended up getting into some really good ones. So here they go. <laughs> One of them, I ended up reading this like in a day and that was Any Given Day, Every Effing Night by Ashley Antoinette. And this is actually the sequel to Birds in the Sky, which y'all know, I didn't really love that book. So this one was a pleasant, pleasant surprise. 
In this one, we continue with the story of like Stacy and Charlie. We get more of Stacy's story or Anastasia's story and her relationship with Day. And this one was so beautiful. Like, <laughs> I didn't think that it would be, you know, like I am really into the stories of women healing and finding their way and people healing and finding their way in love and figuring out what it all means. And this one was one where like, Stacy was having a hard time. She started off having a horribly hard time. And she, you know, had lost her job. If you read um, Birds in the Sky, her cousin Charlie had gotten with Demi and they were doing their whole thing. But it caused a lot of disruption for a lot of people and a lot of like back blow. And Stacy was one of those people who that happened to because charlie ended up sleeping with her boss's husband and he left his wife for her and charlie didn't know that he was married at the time but that comes up again here a lot of blowback again for charlie because now they're together but everyone's judging her and it's a lot but our main characters here are stacy and day and Stacy starts off with a hard time because she had built up her entire career, but now she's jobless and she can't get her client list back because when she merged with this company, she gave it to her. And so she really doesn't know what she's going to do. She's trying to figure it out. She's currently living above her means because she was now making more bank and that's how she orchestrated her life based on what she was making. Mistake, 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 because when the burnout happened and the, she was SOL. And so Day, who is Demi's partner, he got a thing for her, but he doesn't date women. He has sex with them. It's a contracted situation where he pays them. He pays them what they require, what they request. He starts off at 100000 You know, you could get more. You got to prove you're worth it and you got to ask for it. But Stacy's like, what? Like, that's crazy to her. She feels like he's trying to slut her out and she's not here for it. But she needs money. So, <laughs> and Day is like, this is eventually going to end up happening anyway. The chemistry is there. The attraction is there. We're going to end up having sex. You're just getting paid for it. And you're getting paid what you're worth. So, what's the problem? So, we go through this whole journey with them. And it's a lot, but it's beautiful. And I really appreciated it. Um, the discomfort that they shared. The honesty, the vulnerability. I will say that sometimes really only at one point that I feel as if I don't know if Day would have shifted so quickly in his thinking, but maybe because the act that was done to shift his ideology was significant, especially to someone like him who had been burned by women, which is why he currently has the stance that he does of, we're not going to do love. We're not going to do romance. We're going to keep it P and we're going to keep it on paper. <laughs> And so it was just the journey, though, of healing for everyone. I felt like Ashley Antoinette did her big one with this one as a writer. It flowed. It drew you in. She's always been a good writer. Um, but sometimes I feel like it can be a little stagnant. That did not happen here. It was so good. Even the other characters. Listen, we got much more of my boy Nair here. If you've read Ethic or Butterfly, you know. And if you know, you know. And we get so much of him here. Let me tell you it's a connection to Butterfly 5. So read this book. It was it was so, so good. It was so, so good. In my notes, I said it's a really good book. So sad about DJ, though. And all of the storylines, um, this loss shapes everything. But overall, the story felt light and deep and was quickly paced. Um, the thing about Ashley Antoinette is even when I don't agree with the character's beliefs or actions, I always understand on a human level exactly where they are coming from. And that came through and was obvious here. I loved it down, read it in a day, gave this book the first read now. Yeah, this one was definitely a read now. I'm looking at my notes and yikes, that was the only read now of the month, but that shifted the energy for the month. The next book I read is Front Street by Nina or Front Street Porter by Nina. This one, if another person in my life would have told me to read on us, I was going to scream, so I had to get it done. And I did. I read the first one because they was like, you don't need to read Front Street, but I'm someone who needs to read the complete story. I need to know everything. So I read Front Street, and this is the story of the Porter Brothers. We have Dim, Sav, Wreck, Lake, and Vaughn. 
And just these brothers, men, their story. Here we get the foundation, the early years of what's going on with them. And the brothers are a lot. They've lost their father, who really is the only person that like loved them the way they needed to be loved. Their mothers are kind of like all go diggers who maybe they didn't start out that way. Maybe it was genuinely love at one point, but it de-escalated. They don't love their kids. And all of the boys have mother issues because of that. They have abandonment issues because of that. There is their Aunt Moochie. Who can see me? Moochie can see me and get these hands, honestly and truly, because she's their aunt and it's, she's supposed to be the person to love them. And she keeps saying that she does, but it's toxic. She's toxic. And it's not a good role model. And I don't like how she blames everything on Lake. <laughs> so with that, Lake is the eldest brother. He's the one who's really forced and shaped by his father to carry on his legacy if anything happens. They are pushers of weight, but they're like the big ones, not the little ones. They're not in the corner. Um, and so distributors would be more like appropriate and so but they're bringing in bank and so they've been set up for a long time and lake is supposed to sit and be the head of the throne once hassan the father is no longer there and he does but he has to take on that role at 16 it's a lot when we meet him here he's 19 everyone is younger than him so they're all young but they're all living these fast-paced adult lives and we get to see the challenges they're in and I did ended up feeling a lot of emotions here. I didn't like that like Lake was taught that no one would ever love him. And he has internalized that. And Lake is cold and antisocial. He's not my favorite brother. I don't know if that'll change in the On Us series, but like I see all the girlies like, oh my God, Lake, we love Lake. And I'm just like, Lake is like my least favorite brother. <laughs> but we'll see how that goes. I really like Vaunt here. Wreck is a mess. He is a mess. Um, a lot of anger issues for all of them. Uh, Dim has a hard time. He, I like his storyline a lot, though, because he deals with mental health issues, and I like to see how the family rally, rallies behind him and how it's hard for all of the brothers in different ways, especially Sab. Sab's a little brainiac. I can't wait to see his story evolve. Um, but I like the story. I like the characters. Um, I said that this one, initially, especially initially, you could tell that Nina was early in her pen game. I didn't feel like it was as strong. I didn't feel like the narrative voice flowed seamlessly. Um, and I felt like the writer was really trying to find their groove. Eventually, it did end up happening. So I think the second half of this book is much better than the beginning. And then this is just something random. But Vaughn, when he called Ivy his precious, that made me laugh because that made me think of Lord of the Rings. And I wondered if she was a fan. Um, but this book is toxic. I said the toxic, but it grew on me. <laughs> and by the end, I really like these characters and I really found myself missing these characters so much so that last night I started reading the first one, Us book, because I was like, what are my boys up to? Um, but with that being said, the writing was good. Like I said, the voice had to become solidified and grow over time. I didn't hate it. I enjoyed it. Eventually ended up really enjoying it. But I didn't give it a read now. I ended up giving it a read when you have time because I'm hoping to see Nina grow and evolve as a writer in this story as well. But like I said, I, it's a high read when you have time. I did really enjoy it. So those are the books that I read. Before we get out of here, I have like just a minor update. I'm not a hair influencer at all, but I do try a lot of different things on my hair to figure out what works. And this is like one of my favorite twist outs I've ever done. And I want to credit these two products, which y'all have heard of and they're everywhere, but the Moisture Sealing Lotion by Sacred is all that I use as like a leave-in. Um, and then the Tropical Hair Gel by Michi. These two power combo. My hair feels moisturized. I had it twisted up for about a week. Um, I took them out this morning, but it feels moisturized. It looks moisturized. I haven't broken them apart, but just like my initial impression how it feels and how it looks this is like my new go-to for twist outs i just want to say that because i know they're both popular and i know people have really come for sacred i haven't tried the entire line but i really like the moisture sealing lotion um and then michi i haven't tried it for just like a uh, wash and go but the way it was clumping my curls when i was like even combing it through or raking it through in order to twist it up I could definitely see how it could be bomb. But for this twist out, like I said, my hair feels moisturized. It has a lot of definition and hold. Loved it. So not a um, hair influencer, but wanted to share that with you all. 
those are my books my july tbr is coming soon as always i'm Ms. malcolm hughes one who believes that books are sometimes better than people and until the next one please remember to give some time to be kind to each other and to have the very best day of your life on purpose peace or double adios ciao